Hey, my name is Matt Storr and I prepare saxophones for a living and we are overhauling a saxophone together. This is part three and today I am going to get the materials off the keys. So the corks and felts and pads and stuff like that. Um, the way I usually do this is I start off with the materials um, because heating the pad cups up to get the pads out um, means that you know you burn your fingers if you're also trying to like do other stuff to that key at the same time so i kind of do it in two stages um and you can see there's like a little bit of shellac left on this one i'll try and like get most of that off but i don't think it's essential to get like every last fragment this had some cork here you can see these little witness marks, so that is where the arms of the lower stack keys would press up on this bar key. Um, helpful, not necessary, you don't always see that on saxophones. Um, sometimes the, the part on the bar, like if the cork is supposed to go on the bar, then it will actually have like a little cutout. Um, this doesn't have that, but it does have the witness marks to show where they expect people to put a uh, cork. I think I've got a topic on this, but like razor blades are actually not all the same. Some of them are really dull, believe it or not. Um, I don't want to spend all our time like getting off like little tiny bits of shellac, but I do like to get it relatively clean. Um, the ones that I use, uh, I think I've got a link to it in the other video, and maybe I can link to it below, but they seem to be pretty darn sharp. And doing something like this, you know, you'll dull the blade, but it does the job the whole time. But when I'm doing, oh yeah, remember, this guy's stuck. When I'm doing like key quirks and stuff, you'll see that I actually change it out quite a bit. I do not have a lot of hope that that's going to come free, but we'll give it a try. So on this one, probably this will come out with a bit of heat along with the pad, so. There we go. And let's see what these pads look like. I'm imagining they don't even have a cardboard backing. It's just gonna be leather stitched and then the felt will be visible on the back yep there we go so compare this to one of my pads see there's there's a cardboard backing on my pads this is just stitched and cinched tight and that's just felt so it's a very soft malleable pad thickness looks a tiny bit thicker than what I've got going on. Not by a ton, but that might be a thick pad. Also, it's a little bit tough to tell because like it kind of expands over time, gets puffy. If I squeeze it down a little bit, it looks a little more even, right? So using thin pads on this horn is gonna be correct. You can see that center stitch there to hold the leather tight. Um, we're gonna be doing that with resonators. Set that one aside because we're gonna need to do some work on it later uh, to get that roller out. Also, this is a good time to like, you know, just pay attention to what you're taking off, where it is, um, how thick it is. If you've got an original setup horn like this one, you know, the closer you can stick to that, the more likely you are to have good results and kind of argue with the horn a lot less when you are putting it back together. Um, I had a horn recently where just kind of as like a challenge to myself, I was like, all right, let's see if I can get my adjust materials and that whole system of materials. Oh, and like, so this one's done, right? So I'll go ahead and put this back in the container where I'm storing stuff. But um, yeah, I wanted to like give myself a challenge and see if I could, you know, make everything line up. It was on an SML uh, gold metal and it was just like in pristine condition. Um, as far as all original materials and just like hadn't been like banged up and uh 
I wanted to see if I could do adjust materials in such a way that I didn't have to like bend anything and that you know key heights ended up where I wanted them that everything was working together well and um, I did it actually it was really <laughs> kind of cool it felt really uh, like an elegant job you know like I argued with the horn less and I think over time that's kind of like the, one of the things I'm really trying to do with my craft is like you know not just end up with a good result but have like a better experience along the way for me and the horn um, to where we get along better and I think that that basically has to do with just sort of a lot of little things um, because you know all these a lot of the keys and everything are interrelated and um, you know one thing being off a little bit too much shellac or something like that and your pad is um, too thick and then you know it gets everything else in that stack out of whack and having it be to where that is not the case where everything just kind of goes where it's supposed to go and the horn is happy um, is a really rewarding experience that's a big old chunk of metal right there that's heavy and so paying attention to original setup I and mean, this is one of the things I said I think in the previous video I was like I have a hard time thinking about having an apprentice or a helper you know sometimes people would because I've I work slow right so I end up with a wait list and people are like why don't you just get someone to help you and like it's like well because then you wouldn't be getting what you're waiting for you wouldn't be getting my work you wouldn't be getting all the things I learn as I go along um, that make the job hopefully one worth waiting for um, Sounds like one of my chickens laid an egg. And we're not trying to clean this right now, we're just trying to get the materials off. And I personally, you know, the area that I'm going to be covering back up with cork, um, I think it needs to be pretty clean, and I think the surface needs to be like a little bit roughed. Um, different adhesives act different but um it seems to me like it's better to have like a slight bit of rough uh surface where you want things to adhere if you want them to stay and a lot of times on you know original horns um, if you're taking off the materials you'll see that they do actually like rough it up um, prior to putting things on it's an interesting adhesive someone was using Apologize for the chickens. We might hear them talking for a while now. Once one of them gets going, they sort of talk to each other. <laughs> Bonus is, though, we get great fresh eggs. We've got chickens and ducks. Now, if this was a lacquered horn, we'd have to be a little bit more careful with the amount of heat we impart. But since it's plated, we don't really have to worry about that. Um, it would take a lot more heat than I'm likely to use to cause this stuff to bubble. Um, although sometimes, like on wartime horns, I have seen lacquer that, or not lacquer, plating that bubbles like really easily. I think there must have been some sort of shortage in proper materials because wartime silver plate on both sides of the Atlantic uh, just seems to be substandard to the stuff that came before. Um, and also after. That's part of the octave mechanism. Interesting little bit. Oops. Here's the B. So there's no material here. Um, and if I remember right, no material on the B flat where there should be so something came off which side did they put that on I'm guessing here hmm. you can usually put it on either side um, depending on where the linkages are they may also be sliding against each other versus just pressing and so you want to make a decision based on that like what kind of material you use felt is actually pretty slippery Cork can be if you put a little bit of cork grease on it. 
And then of course there's Teflon, but uh, that is a sort of harder surface. Um, you can laminate it onto other things to get a better result, but if you use just Teflon, that's like kind of a hard plastic at the end of the day. So there's our F, Palm F. Sounds a little interesting. It looks like uh, they got one casting here and then they brazed this part on, it looks like. Looks like it's two pieces anyways. You see I use a pin vise to stab the pad and hold on to it when I'm disassembling. Pin vise is a really handy tool. All right, so here's the octave key. This is an important thing to note, the thickness here. So we will remember that when we want to put it back on. And believe it or not, that cork is probably still good. If we, you know, wanted to leave it on, we could, but we're gonna put all new materials on. Um, cork stays good for a lot longer than you would expect. I used to think that it would compress over time, and in certain circumstances, like if there's not enough cork, that's true, but high quality cork actually is a pretty wondrous material that um, really does the job well. I think, you know, we sort of always tend to assume we're smarter and better than those who came before us, but there's a, there's a reason beyond just like intransigence in the marketplace that you know, cork felt leather and leather pads ended up uh, you know, sticking around so long. They really, really do the job well. Um, not to say there aren't synthetic materials that are really great. I mean, I use a good bit of Teflon. That's a really, really handy thing. But it's definitely possible to have a horn feel slick uh, under the fingers without it. Like I said, cork with a little bit of cork grease on a sliding linkage actually works pretty well. This torch I use is just a, I think it's called a, yeah, Blazer ES-1000. I use it most, for most of my work. Um, I have a acetylene torch right here um, that provides a softer heat. I use that for melting shellac and also like on small pads or if I need to, um, you know, get around a pearl somewhere. Oops. But for the most part, I use this butane torch. Um, it does have an adjustable flame. It takes a bit of familiarity with it so that you don't burn lacquer. I wouldn't use a butane torch on like, you know, palm keys on a Selmer. Um, it imparts a lot of heat really quickly. And part of what, you know, burns lacquer is the heat doesn't have time to spread out. Um, and suddenly a little tiny part of it will like get toasty. But on the flip side, if you're trying to like, you know, solder a post or something, um, that temperature is hot enough to burn lacquer. So what you want to do is impart that energy really, really quickly before um, much lacquer has a chance to burn. And, you know, as soon as the uh, solder starts to flow, uh, take the heat off. And sometimes you can, you know, kind of do like a lightning job of soldering and not burn any lacquer. A lot of that is kind of up to the lacquer gods. What the lacquer's been through can change how it reacts. Sometimes stuff I was sure was going to burn doesn't, and sometimes things that I thought had no reason to burn do. But uh, not during pad work. I don't really think that, other than a few mistakes early on in your career, I don't think people should be burning lacquer um, once they know their tools. I think I burned some lacquer maybe sometime in the past year. It was like a horn that it had been like stored somewhere weird. It was clear that the lacquer was strange. Like some of it would flake off in your hands and just like it felt really, really dry. And um, on some random key when I was doing pad work, 
Um, a lot of times there's a smell first. Sometimes even like a little bit of like smoke or steam. Um, and like a tiny little part of it in the back just like got toasted up. I was actually able to take some fresh lacquer and like, you know, I cleaned it first and I took the fresh lacquer and painted onto it and kind of like soaked in and made it pretty much invisible. But uh, that was surprising, but it shouldn't happen too often to you. It is scary though at the beginning, feeling like you're heating these things up and you know, the glues people use in the past, um, you know, the shellac is pretty standard over time, but um, some of the new synthetic shellacs are really, really hot. There's something called George's glue, I think. It's like white, it's mostly for use in clarinets. Sometimes people use it in saxophones, and it's got a really high melt temperature. And that's always a bummer to come across one of those. So it looks like they used shellac to adhere a lot of their stuff, which is fairly normal for this era. It actually does a really, really good job. It's just a pain to clean up. It doesn't really come off too easy. If you heat it, sometimes, like, on a felt, it'll pull most of it with it, but... The rest of the time, it usually just kind of spreads around and scraping it off on parts that are going to be hidden anyways is the way to go. Let's see how funny that is. Like, it's a tiny little key cup, right? But that was not enough heat to make this release because the heat's probably traveling down this nice thick key arm here. So... Let's get you out of there. There we go. Now a lot of this stuff is coming out really clean as far as the pads, but depending on the type of glue or shellac, sometimes it can be really like gooey and when I would take it out, my second step, if I can get it out, would be to take a Q-tip and run it around the edge to get that stuff off. This is coming off pretty clean. Doesn't seem like there's really, other than like a residue, we're pretty much at the surface here. And that's the like true shape of the key cup. Oh yeah, and this thing, so this is like the micro tuner, um, got pointed out to me by a couple people that this is actually the way it's supposed to be. It looks like they make it, then they slot it, and then this is basically just like a really cheap way to like make it tight around those threads. <laughs> I guess you, if it's loose and wobbly, you take it off, you squeeze this a little bit, and then put it back on, and um, that's how they keep it tight. So that's actually not broken. It looks awful, but you know, now that I look at it, yeah, I can see that's actually a slot that's been cut. Not what I expected. I'm gonna go ahead and use a cork removal tool to get the neck cork off here. Mostly clean enough. I want to get like the stuff that's actually got texture to it off because it'll make a little bump when I do my neck cork. And that chunk is just like super hardened. And I know some people will clean this like a lot more. Um, and I've seen people do key cups where they actually clean like all the way down to the metal. They'll use like a wire brush or something like that. 
Um, it's not something I've personally found to be necessary. Um, I've even, you know, like, it seems like different adhesives would not mix well together and make your pad job harder, right? But like I've been, you know, I've had to do like PC work where it's like, okay, it's a you know brand new pad that got put in somewhere or it's, you know, relatively new. It's still very supple. It's just leaking and I want to add some adhesive and I pull it out. So we got to be careful here of the uh, pearl. So I'm keeping an eye on it and making sure that my heat is kind of bouncing off and away. When in doubt, you can use a pearl protector. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so I've actually, again, that's a cork that we want to pay attention to, like the thickness of it, how they did it. Got a lot of shaping going on with that one. Um, you know, I would take the pad out and it would be hot glue and I use shellac. Um, so I figured, well, I'll give it a try and see. So add some shellac. So there's shellac and the hot glue are mixing together and they probably have slightly different melt temperatures, slightly different, like, you know, viscosities that they flow. Like they are different, um, but it really wasn't too noticeable in floating the pad. So, you know, if that is possible, then I think probably having like some slight residue on there when you're putting your pads in is not a huge deal, but um, I don't think there's anything wrong with getting it absolutely clean either. It's just not something that I spend the time to do. I believe this is part of our octave mechanism. Yeah, it's like an unusual piece that's not usually on most saxophones. You know, like this, I can look at it and be like, oh yeah, part of the octave mechanism. But that one um, is an unusual. The one I just did is unusual. Come on. Here's our G, which is kind of unusual. So this piece is bare, and there's a little piece of cork here, and that's it. Sounds like I'm getting a lot of eggs today. Hopefully it's not like distractingly loud on your end. It's pretty loud here, but I guess I'm also used to it. So again, we've got the bar that's round, but they're putting materials on the bar and putting little witness marks for us so we know where things are supposed to go. But uh, it's an unusual way of doing it. Not sure if I will follow their method or do something a little different. Um, seeing how that geometry interacts in practice on the horn uh, is going to have a lot to do with how I end up doing that. Like here's a flat spot for it to interact with the bar, but there's no material there. So I could put material there if I wanted to and have it be there instead of on the bar, but not sure. How exactly that's going to end up going. All right, we're heading into the home stretch here. Hopefully, my GoPro isn't overheating on my head. And some of you might be cringing watching me like use a razor blade close to my hands, but um, it is extremely rare for me to get a small cut, and I've never gotten a big one. Just the way you handle it, and like what you know, you see me bracing it, and a lot of times, you know, like even here, like it probably didn't look like it, but there's stuff in the way. It would be like if I got myself, it would be like down in here. Um, but yeah, sometimes you do get cut. You got to be careful, but uh, avoiding it completely. Avoiding getting stabbed by springs, small cuts, small burns is probably not a realistic expectation. 
uh, when you're overhauling a saxophone. I remember when I first started, you know, I was getting cut and burned a lot. Um, doesn't happen very often anymore. And it did seem like, I don't know if this is just crazy talk, but it did seem like over time, you know, it hurt less and also I healed faster. At least if it was an injury like in the same place that I'd previously, you know, stabbed or cut myself. actually got a little bit of like shellac around the edges that I want to get out. Okay. There's our spring slot. Remember how I was like having trouble getting stuff out? It's a pretty little spring slot. It definitely keeps it from popping out by accident. exception of this roller we have this horn disassembled now and uh, that'll be the next thing we, we give a try my name is Matt Storr I repair saxophones for a living hopefully you found that helpful useful and informative um, we are overhauling a saxophone together and uh, next up we will try and get this roller off thanks for watching